Okay. So to keep to time, we're going to start recognizing that people will filter in through the introduction. Um, welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Laura Lee. I'll be guiding you through the session, which is uh, under COVID under 19, co-creating with children to inform child protection policy and practice during the pandemic. And um, we are joined by, uh, by many people here, which is wonderful. Um, okay, a quick opening activity. Why don't you turn your video on? <laughs> and with your hand, show us how many cups of coffee or tea you've had today. <laughs> well done. I see anything from one to four so far. <laughs> Mine is only because it's still early, but <laughs> zero. Well done. There may be another beverage of choice, but uh, okay, great. So I am the, um, the COVID-19 focal point for the Alliance, and I'm just hosting you here today. I have a huge heart for um, participation and um, partnering with children and youth. And it's wonderful here to have, uh, have Ali Hassan Takar with us here today, who is a youth volunteer working on child and human rights in Pakistan um, for an organization called Group Development Pakistan. And we'll get to hear much more about that from him. And we also have Kristen Hope here with us today, who will be speaking. And she's the Advocacy, Research and Participation Advisor at Terre des Hommes Foundation. For over a decade, she's worked in research and advocacy in the field of child protection and justice for children. Her work attempts to transform the principle of empowerment into practice by using action-oriented research and participatory approaches, contributing to building virtuous circles that transform policies and practices at macro level while catalyzing positive real life changes for children and families at the micro level. So we're privileged to, um, to have uh, Kristen and Ali with us here to share today. And we look forward to hearing from those of you who have joined us as well. Um, so I'm going to invite Kristen who will introduce herself and invite um, Ali to share some reflections as well. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and yeah, I also wanted to spend, send a really special thanks to Ali um, for, for joining us today here. Um, can you see our screen? Yes. Super. So, um, Yes, yeah, so as Laura said, my name is Kristen Hope and I work with Terre des Hommes and I've been coordinating the COVID under 19 initiative, which we're here to talk to you about today. Ali, did you want to say something before we get started? Uh, just a short introduction that my name is Ali Hassan Tucker and I am from Peshawar, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa district of Peshawar. And I'm a youth volunteer working on human rights with focus on children rights. Fantastic, Ali. Thank you. And so um, I just thought it'd be really, we both thought it'd be interesting to start by hearing from Ali a little bit about what it's like to have been a child in Pakistan during the pandemic. So Ali, what was, what was it like lockdown for you, the experience of lockdown? Well, in light of uh, the COVID-19, the lockdown was starting up, started a bit later, but before lockdown, all the educational institutes were got closed. So it was uh, really shocking for all the students because from one day after their exams was going to be started. So there were whole lockdown, the pressure of academic uh, exams that what are going to be happen as there were no any clear uh, policies from the government till the last point. Uh, like there was a huge pressure on the children that exam is gonna happen, not happen. Will it be tough? Will we will be able to go to school again? Will we be able to survive the COVID? Or will we be able to uh, attend the examination due to the pressure of COVID? And 
except that uh, there was a, a high level of uh, depression and anxiety due to the lack of physical activity and social interaction as people were not able to meet their good friend their best friend their family members their relative and the, those all persons which they usually used to meet after a day or after or even once in a week so it was really tough during the lockdown but uh, at all we all fight it through and now the lockdown is over so uh, after that uh, it's life now so as the lockdown ended everything resumes but uh, we know we all know that we cannot come to the normal routine very soon it will usually take the time to back to the normal life and the most important the thing is life in now uh, is that fear and psychological pressure that may be corona return corona stays for lifetime or there may be second wave or third wave or maybe we never be able to uh, fight with covid or we you know, means there are different thoughts so uh, there is the only difference that is the only one difference life before covid during covid and after covid um, and just hearing all about all of that uncertainty about the future that you're sharing, um, what would you say are some of the you know most significant issues that have faced children in your community, and what are some of the the initiatives that you've been involved in to um, yeah to counter the, the the challenges that you faced? Well, in the whole lockdown, I kept uh, an eye on all the issues related to children and human rights. And uh, some of the key observations or the key issues which I was able to observe was lack of access to basic health facilities. Mean that there was a fear like if we go to hospitals or healthcare centers, uh, we have a high chance of getting in contact to corona, which even caused more deaths than the corona. Like uh, people died due to heart attack uh, or uh, people contacted polio or other. Uh, there was also no vaccination in the whole lockdown. So the first one which I noticed was the basic health facilities lacking. The second was increasing domestic violence and abuse. As I mentioned earlier that there was uh, uh, increase in the level of depression and anxiety uh, or uh, and psychological issues which lead to violence in any kind of violence like uh, violence in home or violence uh, like uh, if we get uh, pressurized we don't know that why we became angry and after becoming angry we have no self-control so we can do anything so in that sense there was a huge increase in violence against children and domestic violence, sexual abuse. Uh, means we can, see, in a nutshell, we can say that whereas there was increase in violence. Uh, the third observation where I was able to know, observe was increase in child labor and begging. As most of the guidance or family member lost the, their jobs and they become weak economically so they started begging and they also forced their children or their kids uh, to beg so that they can earn something uh, while they the only reason behind this was the uh, covid taking their jobs from them uh, and the other observation I was able to make was increased online activities which uh, give the chance to online uh, abusers and online harassers uh, to bully people online to blackmailing and there was also increase in cyber uh, there was also increase in a risk of uh, being unsafe cyberly. So, and I mostly focused during the uh, COVID and lockdown on uh, awareing people and sharing my experiences of cyber safety with children. And uh, some of my action during COVID was a regular social media campaign and article writing through which I engage myself so that I can be away from depression, I can keep myself engaged, bring some creativity in my life. Uh, so I wrote an article on how to be safe from 
uh, how to be safe by cyber uh, crimes. And the other was on uh, child sexual abuse. And both of them were published in the national newspaper of Pakistan. Also, their links are available and they can be searched on Google. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali, for sharing that really powerful picture snapshot of what life has been like for you for the past few months since the start of the COVID pandemic. Um, and it was so important, I think, for us um, uh, to, to, when we think about, you know, child participation, child protection, I think what is really essential is that we root all of our discussions here as, you know, as adults, and as practitioners in the lived experience of children. And so I'm so grateful to you for sharing those things. Um, and, um, and, and, and you, we'll continue to hear more from your experience through this presentation. And, um, and, and, and moving from that, really what we sought to do at the outset of COVID under 19 was to recognize that children were experiencing this pandemic as a really generational shifting moment. And therefore, if we wanted as practitioners to, um, to, to, you know, engage with that, then we needed to do so alongside children. And so the initial idea for COVID under 19 was to create a broad alliance, a broad coalition of children like Ali, who are, you know, experiencing um, disproportionately um, some of the, the hardship of the pandemic in terms of the disruption to their daily lives, um, and, um, but also who are mobilizing to challenge it in the ways that they have access to, like Ali so eloquently spoke about his work on spreading awareness about online protection by publishing an article in the national newspaper. And so COVID under 19 is trying to bring together children like Ali across the world alongside child rights practitioners like Taldazam and others, um, alongside academics, alongside UN agencies, alongside other national and local organizations in order to build together um, a post-COVID world which has children at the center. So in terms of what COVID under 19 looks like, it is a very broad-based coalition. It comprises over 30 organizations, again, international organizations, local organizations like GD Pakistan, um, uh, from where um, from Ali is, is, has been working as a volunteer with them. We also have key academic partners, our lead academic partner is Queen's University Belfast, who has been working with us, the, the Centre for Children's Rights, um, on designing um, the research-based methodology that we've been using in this initiative. Um, and alongside them, we also have uh, a key partner has been the um, uh, Najat Ma'allam Majid, the Special Representative to the Special, to the uh, Secretary General on Violence Against Children and her office, who have also been really reinforcing the weight of this initiative when it comes to engaging with uh, duty bearers. Um, alongside an, a whole group of, of, of organizations and um, and there was I was just in a presentation uh, beforehand about also the power of advocacy and I think this COVID under 19 is a broad-based initiative that really demonstrates how much can be achieved when we work together because what have we been able to do um, since the, the start of the pandemic um, COVID under 19 has really sought to capture children's experiences of the pandemic and do that in a way um, that children have been involved. So we launched the um, We've launched and to date, and I'll speak a little bit more, but we we, we co-created a survey with children. So we asked children, you know, what they would like to ask other children about their experiences during the pandemic. So we created a, um, um, a survey um, and, um, and we also engaged with children. So this was phase one in April and May, um, engaged with 270 children from 20 countries to really understand what is it that they wanted to know about other children's experiences. And then we, we brought in the experiences of all the other partners, the academics, the NGOs, in order to create a survey to capture children's experiences. Um, that survey was rolled out throughout the summer in June and July, or the, the northern summer, or the, 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 the southern hemisphere winter. Um, and, um, and again, children and young people were very involved because they we have also, um, we have uh, on the steering group, we have some 18-year-olds, um, so um, teenagers, even though they're not children, they're still young people. Um, and um, some of them were managing our social media channels, and they were engaged 
engaging with other children to design content for social media as we were spreading the survey, um, disseminating the survey. And, um, and Ali can speak a little bit also about his role in that because he was incredibly active in his community. Um, then leading into August and September. So where we are now is that we've actually, um, we have the results of that survey, 26,000 responses from children aged eight to 17 years old. Um, and we have been running a series of online digital camp um, sessions in order to train children in data analysis methodology. So both in quantitative and qualitative data analysis. And then we've been giving the data to children so that they can make meaning of the data. So um, I think what's really significant about this process is that this is as much a participant a, a, a substantive piece about children's participation as much as it is in a research piece, as much as it's an advocacy piece. And now we're in the process of finalizing um, the, you know, that, that whole participatory process of the data analysis um, in order to launch and disseminate the results in um, towards the end of this month, October. Um, and so, as I said, um, you know, the, the central piece of the COVID under 19 process uh, was a online survey, which was available in 28 languages, plus an easy read version for children with um, intellectual um, uh, diff different intellectual abilities, um, uh, which was available in English. But what was also very important is that we realized that um, the, that COVID was uh, amplifying the digital divide that we all know already exists for children. So we knew that children who aren't you know, online were also being disproportionately affected in terms of their ability to um, access education. So we knew that if, we, if the survey just remained online, we would not be able to engage with children who were more marginalized or you know, who, who didn't have internet access. So we also created a facilitators pack and we equipped frontline practitioners such as those working with Tardazam or GD Pakistan or other organizations, other partners to equip social workers, psychologists with the tools that they needed to administer Administer the survey to more um, uh, marginalized children. For example, children uh, living in detention centers or in um, you know rehabilitation centers. Or GD Pakistan, for example, did an incredible amount of work in um, frontline practitioners reaching children with disabilities. Um, so so we ensured that they, that we were able to um, to access children's perspectives who were not online. Um, this is the the data set is the largest global survey of children's experiences during. During COVID. And it's also the only survey that was designed and analyzed with children. And it focuses on children's experiences of their rights during the pandemic. Um, what's also quite interesting is that it, we've, through our different partnerships, we've been able to link with a number of different initiatives and research projects, including the Global Kids Online project, which is being conducted by LSE, um, the COVID 4P log, which is a, um, uh, an app which is being developed to, um, to ask practitioners and policymakers about their decision-making processes when it comes to children's rights during the pandemic um, and, um, and also the Destination Unknown campaign which is being engaged with, um, with children um, on the move um, and recently they published a, um, a report in terms of children's participation in the, the global compacts on, uh, on safe and orderly migration. So this is in a nutshell um, uh, the, the process. Um, just as an example, for example, we've been running these training sessions online. I mentioned about training children in online data analysis. So here is a snapshot of um, actually one of Laura Lee's colleagues um, from IICRD, uh, Laura Wright, who's been uh, amazingly active in this process as well, one of a, a great partner on, in, in the, um, the coalition. Um, and this is due trying to, you know, um, uh, uh, train children in, um, you know, ideas for qualitative coding and categorizing of data. And actually, Ali, you were involved in this session, weren't you? Um, and so it'd be really great to hear from you how you've been involved in COVID under 19 and what that's meant for you. Mm, yeah, I was part of that session. So basically, first of all, I would like to mention that what was my motivation or my uh, uh, I mean, what motivated me to be part of it? So the first thing which motivated me was my experience as, as I am working and it's my passion to work from human and children rights. So first thing was that and the second was that I belong from a marginalized part of uh, uh, Pakistan where mostly sh such activities didn't happen and children are not given the opportunity to participate. So that was one of my wishes that, that I should speak for the children of my province. 
I should rest wise of uh, the my province children and in other provinces people are getting chances. They are speaking. They are rising voice for their self. But there is no one from our side. So that was one of my biggest motivation. Uh, the secondly, I was that I wanted to raise awareness among my friends, peer groups, and community that what was the role and what is the role of child participation. And uh, it was to make them realize that working for children without children is uh, almost impossible. So, uh, like, if you don't have the main stakeholder, you can't do a work. I mean, if you are making a legislation, if you don't have legislators, so you can't make a legislation. If you are running a country, but you don't have a, uh, a government to run the country, then you can't run the, uh, uh, the country like in, uh, like in the way which you need to be. So that was uh, one of uh, those things. Second, well, uh, I would like to mention that it was a really meaningful experience as children were first time, I think, got such a platform where they can themselves share uh, their views. And it was like uh, also their right to privacy, right to uh, identification was not uh, uh, discriminated means uh, there was, uh, uh, they were being satisfied that this information won't be used in a bad way or it will not be shared with a wider group of people without any, without uh, a bad intention. So that was one of the best part of the survey. And secondly, uh, that how I played my role. So I firstly sh uh, shared it with my network, like my friends, my cousins, my family members, my school members. And uh, I, I did follow up with them. They, they have uh, failed it or not. They have forwarded it to their friends or not. How are they feeling? What are their feedback? and what improvement they want in this kind. Are they comfortable to share such information and not? Also, I give some of the suggestions during this survey to my friends, my colleagues and peer groups that never share your personal information as it can be misused. Uh, secondly, think before sharing personal picture and videos as it is your property. No one has the right to watch or see it. Uh, if, especially when you are uncomfortable with they watching it or they seeing it. Uh, so, and you have the right, it is your right. So don't feel be ashamed to say, no, you can't watch it or no, I can't send it to you. The third one that never accept a friend request from a stranger or older person than you because you don't know him. When you don't know him, you don't need to be uh, you don't need to be in contact with him. Like, like, why should I talk to a stranger? Why should I share my information, my contacts, or my friend's name, my address with a stranger? Like, why he want to know about me? What is the reason behind that? So that's why I uh, motivated them. I shared them that how can this information you share with a stranger can be used uh, against you which can harm you. And the other thing is that uh, I also uh, did uh, realize them that it's their parents' responsibility uh, to know what you are doing on internet and you should share your daily activities on internet or your daily usual activity. Like we should not only focus on cyber safety, but on our only activity. So your parents need to monitor you. And if you have any problem, the first person you need to concern is your parents. And that's just so brilliant. And when you when we were preparing this session and I was and I said to Ali, what is it that you're interested to talk about? He was he is very interested in the topic of online um, safety. And I think what's so and it's so amazing to hear how his own work in this topic has um, also um, through the work of COVID under 19, been able to make links and through the sharing of the survey um, and, and talking about, you know, how, you know, on one hand, we have, you know, had this online uh, process for um, 
for you know consent um, and also if there was a, um, a frontline practitioner supporting a child um, uh, to fill the survey they had to um, you know uh, adhere to um, you know upholding safeguarding confidentiality which was actually logged um, in in the online system and then in in co so in on, on one hand like the safety of the online survey but on the other hand the opportunity that that opened up to talk about how children can be safe online because so much is, is, is happening online. Um, and so with that, I think that I just wanted to um, conclude with a few kind of key messages about our, the experience working in COVID under 19 so far. Um, and I think that that overall, what, um, what, what, what is, is clear to me is that um, it is possible to conduct rights-based ethical child participation in research and advocacy even during a pandemic. And actually, um, another, uh, an 18 year old who's on our steering committee, he would say, especially during a pandemic, actually, this is the time where we need to be, you know, challenging ourselves to do better. Um, so, um, so, you know, the, I think the, the children, the young people are also, you know, they see this also as much as, as, as um, an opportunity um, as, uh, you know, for, for, for the potential for the phoenix to rise out of the ashes um, if we can meet them halfway and support them to get there. So obviously the participatory approach is an end in itself. We're upholding children's right to be heard in this pandemic, but it's also a means to an end because it's an opportunity for us as adult practitioners to be shifting power towards children, to be creating alliances with children, to be supporting children like Ali in you know, achieving their own ambitions as child human rights defenders in their communities. Um, and so you know, it makes us ask questions about how are we integrating children our in, into our decision-making structures when we plan for a global campaign? How are we um, cultivating spaces for peer exchange, like the, the, the virtual camp where children from, like Ali from Pakistan can exchange with children from Kenya and children from you know, Cyprus about online safety. And, and these are the sorts of things that we're putting in place to enable this um, participatory approach. Um, and at the whole time, you know, the whole way through also, you know, trying to ensure that at the end of the day, the children who participate, you know, leave this process with reinforced knowledge and skills for how they can you know be, move forward in their own journeys as child human rights defenders so with that I just wanted to hand back to Ali for a few concluding remarks so uh, this these are the some key messages uh, or the my messages to the all part of people not only government children but every stakeholder uh, like civil society organization children themselves and the whole community media uh, that uh, first of all the responsibility to provide the platform or to engage children is of state so state should realize it that uh, state should take the responsibility to engage children in constructive activities and it is uh, like uh, i in my view such service should be done by the uh, government first. After that, other stakeholders should also take it. So one of the key messages that first of all, government need to take a step. Secondly, that uh, uh, civil society and government should ensure, ensure child protection uh, and counseling services like uh, uh, providing a mechanism of child helplines like toll free number on which children can uh, report any kind of abuse or violence with them or they uh, or a toll free number which can be easily accessible on which they can complain about anything like not only abuse but discrimination violence or if they have any other problem like if some academic problem or some uh, teacher is misbehaving with him uh, someone is mistreating without any reason, cyberbullying, cyber, cyber policing, so all of this. And to initiate child safety programs for vulnerable children. From vulnerable children here, I mean the children that don't have access to education, technology. As I can see, a lot of people are saying that, what about the children who don't have internet access or no access to technology? So from here, the, from the word vulnerable uh, children, I mean, same those people. There should be mechanism to uh, include uh, them and make uh, or spread awareness among them. The other thing, the key uh, message I would uh, like to share with that, 
there is need of a one next pro program for vulnerable children same here i again refer to vulnerable children as children those who are doing labor or children who lives on street uh, children those who collect garbages on daily basis or children working in workshops like uh, uh, we have our parents uh, internet uh, teachers to guide us but they have no one to guide us so it's our responsibility as a youth as a child to motivate them to support them and to spread awareness among them secondly uh, it's uh, my request and my message to the children themselves that speak for yourself you are the stakeholder until you don't speak for yourself no one will be speak for you so also you have to take a step for yourself thank you and thank you ali and thank you for also you know being here today with us and for all of the work that you've done to um to inspire other children in the process um and um uh, and I just think that I wanted to end by saying to the audience today that um, thank you all for listening. Um, we're looking forward to any questions that you have. And also please follow us on our social media channels because we have young people like Ali and many others from other countries who are preparing social media content for our big launch and dissemination, um, which will come in October and November. Also, we're preparing several different events um, and again, designing them with children um, like Ali and his peers. So thank Thanks to you all. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you so much, Ali, for your inputs and your insights. It's incredible what COVID under 19 is doing. Um, an example of a rights-based participatory research project that is ethically done and includes all the safeguarding measures um, possible and ways to engage marginalized children as much as possible recognizing technological challenges. Ali, thank you so much for all you're doing in your community and what you're sharing with us and what you're now doing globally and uh, really working on behalf of those in your community um, and it's just wonderful to hear. So we are going to have a chance to engage with these questions. We still have time. Um, I would like to do a quick thing. Please put on your videos and grab a paper and pen or pencil or a crayon or coloring marker. And what I would like you to do is to draw, take one to two minutes to draw what meaningful partnership between children and adults looks like to protect children during infectious disease outbreaks. So what meaningful partnership between children and adults to protect children during infectious disease outbreaks looks like? You don't have to be an artist. We'll just uh, draw your impression of meaningful adult child partnerships. If everybody wants to show us your art when you're ready. I know we won't be able to hear from everybody. Amazing. We see adults and children working together, hearts. We see listen listen meaningfully um mine is and bamboo mine, shoots you can just see two squares okay what's yours ali uh you can see only two squares but the logic behind it is that the outer square is the adult and the inner one is the child so the outer one is protecting the inner one so same is the role of adult to protect the children wonderful Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. Mine is a bamboo shoot because bamboo shoots, it looks like people are doing their own thing, but they actually share a whole rooted system under the ground. So if we're rooted together, we can um, create amazing things together. Um, can I have a volunteer to share to share one more?
Amy, yours is still on the screen. Would you like to share? Yeah, sure. Um, I just drew a group of children and adults actually coming together. And so in the midst of adults, there's actually children who's, um, who's, who are visible and hopefully they're heard and listened to and that they're contributing meaningfully. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amy. Okay. Kristen, did you have one? <laughs> okay. Um, so a question for, for you, um, for you, Ali, and uh, there's a lot of questions and um, exciting excitement engagement here. Um, so please do keep adding your questions. So for Ali, how were you convinced to represent ch the children? Um, did you always have this passion to advocate for the rights of children from your community? And how did you convince other children to participate? I think you touched on some of that, but if you could expand a bit, that would be wonderful. Like uh, I could say that it was my passion to work for humanity. Like it's not about profession or uh, for earning purposes or any other purpose. Like it's a passion, it's a dedication. Uh, it's my dedication to work for humanity, not only for children, but for human humanity and human rights. Like I would not only focus on children's rights, like mainly my focus is on children's rights, but I am covering a wider range. Like I'm also working on cyber safety. So that is a completely separate field from child rights. Like cyber safety covered women rights, children rights, and even it's for the adults, not only for the children. And uh, the, uh, the question about convincing is that I can't force someone, but I can share my own experiences with them that how can, how I learned, uh, uh, what can you earn, what can you do, what can this help in your future, and how can it, uh, even how can it help you in professional life? Like maybe someone said that it's not beneficial in uh, professional life, but it's completely incorrect. Like uh, for some people, if they want to make it their profession, they can make it. Thank you so much. And I don't know, Ellie, if you're following the chat box, but there's lots of yeah, amazing, keep it up and well done there. <laughs> um, and did you provide, um, did providing information about internet safety increase their children's willingness to participate in the survey or other yes, aspects when, of the program? Uh, children were ensured, uh, sorry, just sorry to interrupt. Uh, when uh, children were ensured that, uh, that their identity will be kept secret, Therefore, uh, they felt more happy to share their view. Like they said that no one will know that who's writing it. So we can openly express our views. And can I just jump off that to also say that then this was, um, you know, we did, they did pose some ethical questions about, well, how do we ensure, you know, how do we uphold, you know, sort of, um, you know, um, you know the, the do no harm approach, and so we. One of the partners with the organ, with the initiative is um, Child Helpline International, and we made sure that at every stage. So just a number of things. For example, no question was um, obligatory in the survey, so a child could skip any question. They were informed that at the beginning, um, um, and then they were informed that if they wanted that, if they had any questions or any concerns, they could also they were provided with them the Child Helpline number for their country. Um, but in addition, as well, because we were working with a wide range of organizations we were also um you know we we had some infrastructure in place to you know support if we knew that say as frontline practitioners were administering the survey if they encountered any particular child protection um concerns they were able to you know report that using their standard uh, reporting uh, procedures in the organization um and the last thing that i would say with respect to online safety is that um is that also because it was anonymous so at least you know children were also very, very honest. And some of the data that we got was also very, um, um, very, I mean, in, you know, as, as you get, you get um, data, which can be really, um, 
revealing, um, you know, and, and, and disturbing. And so for us now, this is like the, 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 the turn when we have to be accountable to all of those 26,000 children who shared their views. I've been working on some of the data myself, and there are some children who are saying, I don't even know if anyone's listening to me. But actually, we have to now show them as a community of practice of child protection professionals that we are listening to them and that we are taking their views into account and that they can be involved and in the next steps when we think about how are decisions made in the next months and years as this pandemic continues to affect children's lives. It is our responsibility to be accountable to these children who have shared their experiences with us. Uh, just to add here a point. Yes, Ali, go ahead. Yeah, so um, there is a question arises that what about the children who, who got support from the guidance or somewhat supported him in the filling the survey, like an adult. So there was also a concert form for that adult uh, that he will keep all the information to himself and he can't share it with anyone else. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, Kristen. Um, we're getting a few questions around um, around uh, engaging with persons and children with disabilities. So perhaps you could touch on how um, in COVID under 19, uh, you managed to include children with disabilities and those with learning and physical disabilities. Thanks. Ali, did you wanna say something on this topic? Oh, well, uh, yeah, I, I will reply it. Okay, I can, I can also jump okay, in. So here. really uh, it was, the, Okay, so the most of the important thing, thing was to bring diversity in the survey, is to touch all the parts of community, poor, rich, uh, disabled, transgender, uh, physically challenged, uh, like uh, mentally challenged, or uh, migrants, refugees. So uh, it wasn't work of a one person. So uh, as uh, it was discussed earlier by a Christian that GDP was part of it and GDP was supporter in Pakistan. So there were field officers of group development, Pakistan GDP, who visited different communities and they supported them to fill these surveys. So uh, uh, during that physically disabled, uh, transgender, migrant, uh, religious my, uh, minorities, every aspect was covered, school children, while, uh, while uh, to add one thing, that SOPs were strictly followed during these activities. Yeah, and I was just writing in this chat box. Thanks, Ali. And again, GD Pakistan did amazing work in, you know, again, through the frontline practitioners in, in, uh, in working with children um, uh, with disabilities in order to include their perspectives. Um, and so, um, as did many other organizations. Um, and so, um, and now in terms of the data analysis, what we're doing, so we're, we are currently analyzing the data according to, um, you know, these kind of top line themes that we have, you know, child rights, you know, your, your standard, you know, education, uh, poverty, health, uh, play and leisure, violence and safety, the, the big themes. Um, and again, we're working with children like Ali and his peers to analyze that data, to make meaning of that data. But also because we have demographic information about children, children from migrant communities, LGBTIQ communities, children with disabilities, we're also going to be developing specific thematic um, uh, summaries around those specific topics and we will be you know using the same methodologies um, to involve those children from those groups in analyzing the data set that's relevant to them. So working with our partners in Destination Unknown, we will work with a group of child children on the move, child migrants, in order to make meaning of the data related to children who identified as refugees or from migrant communities. Similarly, working with colleagues in GD Pakistan, we will be working with them to um, make sure that children who you know, um, ha identified as having disabilities can have a look at the data that was, you know, the received by other children and make meaning of that. What does it mean for them? And what do they then want out of it? How, what advocacy messages do we make from that data involving those specific groups of children every time? So that's also um, one of the things that we're doing. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Ellie. 
Um, and one other question about um, where I'm combining a few questions around the survey is how have you engaged marginalized and vulnerable children? How did you handle gender, gender representation? And what has been the engagement of girls and the issues coming out specifically around, around girls or if something specific jumped out around boys? Why, like earlier mentioned that I said that the field officers visited to different area and uh, it was kept in mind that the survey should not only be filled by uh, boys, uh, like the survey should not be boys or girls dominant. And uh, there was also the option for neither or to not tell that uh, gender. So this option were provided, it was up to them to fake the gender or to show their real gender, they want to share, not to share. It was up to them. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it, uh, the focal persons or the field officers, the volunteers tried their best to give equal representation to every part. Like uh, I said that they visited to uh, Christian community, refugees, uh, schools, uh, uh, disabled community, children on the labor. Like there was another question arise in the mind of viewers that how those people who are connected who don't have access in the technology. So those uh, uh, officers, those volunteers, write it down their answer with themselves on a paper and literally they converted into, uh, they filled the online survey themselves through their own, uh, their answers themselves. So uh, that was how uh, it was kept equal among the gender and uh, minorities uh, or religious minorities, uh, disabilities uh, in every aspect. Yeah, so exactly as, as Ali said, we had that whole facilitators pack for frontline practitioners and that will all be written up in the methodology. Um, and um, uh, I did see a question in the, the, the chat about what, how can we assure that adults, you know, uh, actually accurately represent children's views? Well, obviously, you know, as someone who's, you know, I'm living in London, I cannot ensure that, you know, a frontline practitioner in any country is 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 upholding children's views. I cannot, but they, you know, the fact that um, I can't check that individually, but the security, the, the, the safeguarding mechanisms we have, and these are all frontline practitioners working with well-known international organizations who have their own, you know, training, safeguarding, um, you know, and they are child protection practitioners at essence. They are social workers, they're psychologists. Um, they're not researchers that we've hired as consultants. Um, and so, so that's inbuilt. Um, and um, so that quality assurance is inbuilt by virtue of the good quality partnerships that we have with international and national organizations who we know who do good work. Um, and then um, and then just to reinforce the point about, well, in terms of, I, I'm, we're not in a position to speak about the results. Um, so I, so the questions about gender, um, uh, et cetera, we can't, um, I can't say, you know, has there been significant differences at this stage, but you know, what is really important about the way that, um, that we have, we have like quite a substantial amount of demographic information about self-identified children how they've self-identified um so so we are able to look at trends and look at you know this um uh you know the disproportionate impact on certain groups who have identified based on their ethnicity or migration status or sexuality etc so you know the the data itself is going to be and it is the it is the biggest data set you know made um, by children and reported by children um, of children's experiences um, uh, across COVID. So it's pretty exciting. And we hope that many of you who are asking these questions will catch up with us later on when we, when we disseminate the actual findings. Absolutely, it's incredibly exciting. And um, we want you to go to your chat box and there is a Mentimeter link. And all you need to do is Type in one word or a phrase of something you take away from the session. In just a few seconds to do that. Okay. Okay, and as that's coming up on the screen, um, we are just concluding the session now as we see our words coming up on the screen. Um, I will give Kristen and Ali each um, a, 
a minute to um, for your final words. So Kristen, what is your final takeaway or final words today? Again, it's just to thank everyone um, who's listened and to thank Ali so much for sharing his incredible energy and um, and I, I'm just I've, I've learned from him. I actually when we, we were talking about the online uh, safety, um, some of the things that he was saying was really, um, you know, was was infor informative for me. And so I think this is the best thing about these sort of partnerships when we realize as adults that we learn from children and we're not just here to to, you know, to tell them or to, you know, yes, we're here to protect them. Yes, we are duty bearers. Yes, we have responsibilities, but also when we listen, we can learn a lot. So thank you, Ali, and thanks to everyone on this journey in COVID under 19. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was really a honor to be with you all and learning with you, sharing my own experience with you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, do you have one message for other children? And you? Well, again, I will focus on the same message that you children should talk for themselves. They should raise a voice themselves for themselves. And we need to empower children. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And all of our work, all of our child protection uh, programming and research and initiatives need to be engaging children and youth and designed to meaningfully listen and uh, work in partnership. And this has really supported that. So thank you so much, Ali. Thank you everyone for being here today. Um, thanks again to our speakers, Kristen and to Ali and for all the work that you're doing. And on behalf, we know you represent a large team. And so we just thank you for this work that will really turn into meaningful results um, and moving forward. So. I wanna thank you all for joining this session and here's the instructions for the closing. Um, please make your way directly over to the plenary space in Kiko Chat for today's wrap up. All you need to do to leave the Zoom room, you find the plenary space in Kiko Chat, join the plenary and click to join the plenary Zoom room. We'll see you there momentarily. Thank you so much. <laughs>